Grand Existence, Citizens of the Universe. I'm JD, this is my Pharmacopoeia, and we're gonna jump right into it today. So you see I got the whiteboard out here, and where I finished off in my last explanation was that the ultimate truth and the fundamental nature of reality and the quintessence of existence is unfortunately outside of language and words and um, outside of senses and it is especially outside of materialist reductionist determinism okay and this is exactly what I'm going to explain to you today how can truth so what is truth is the real nature of the way that things work okay so actually I'm going to begin this with like a little um, karmic definition because what we have around us in this world is karma and what karma basically means is that you believe that the world works in a certain type of way, right? You believe it goes through certain processes, certain mechanisms, certain methods that maybe not in nature, it just depends on who you are. It is the idea that something's happening in a certain type of way when actually in reality, what you have really is simply a false idea. It's just an idea it's a pseudo belief. It is, it is a belief which has no foundation in reality. It's just a pattern of thoughts that you like holding on to. And so what karma really is, is that you act in accordance with your own personal way of how you think the world works. And then you experience all sorts of roadblocks, stumbling blocks, like all sorts of twists and turns that you're not expecting because... The world doesn't actually operate to the way you think your mind is working and the real nature of reality has got to step in and basically cut you off and be like, sorry, bro, you got some karma you need to deal with, AKA soul searching, AKA looking inside yourself to get rid of the pseudo knowledge, just the beliefs, the implicit, the implied ideas about reality that we've been culturally indebted with. Now, it's not an easy thing to do, and beliefs are really weird because it's not something you even try to pick up. It's just something that kind of just, like, snaps together in your brain, and your logical Maya mind says, yeah, sure, let's go with that. And then next thing you know, you're 40 years old, and you got to go back to the basics. So here are the basics. Essentially, what scientists were trying to do with this materialism with these double slit experiments they're trying to discover the fundamental nature of reality and they do this by looking at light okay they look at photons which are individual packets of light energy which have at least two different natures to them and i'm going to explain what these natures are so remember that this really begins with galileo and the clockwork universe it was extended on by Isaac Newton and further improved, further karmically indebted by Albert Einstein. And what was set out to happen in the Renaissance <laughs> is that they wanted to do away with the notion of occult forces and they wanted to prove that everything has some sort of physical explanation, a mechanical explanation. A mechanical physics to it okay and they did this by breaking down what they believed is the smallest piece of matter that they could they could they could actually tangibly measure and like I said those pieces of this not really matter it's photons which is energy from the electromagnetic spectrum being emitted by. This is our sun. So the experiment basically works like this. There is a photon source, which is emitting photons through the infamous double slits. Now let's think about this from a materialist perspective, because that's what I assume most people are already doing. If you fired a bunch of photons through two slits and then this is like the thing the detector 
behind the slits, you would expect photons to either travel through this slit or that slit and then appear on the sensor. So just to be clear, they don't fire just one photon. That's practically impossible. Photons practically don't even really exist, but they fire a, a, like hundreds, thousands, a lot of photons, a very small period of time through these slits. And you would expect them logically, if you're using your Maya brain, that you would get a bunch of little slits like that. Okay. So there's another detector. This is the detector. You would either get a bunch of dots on that come through one side of the slit or a bunch of dots that come through the other side of the slit. And these are our photons, right? So if you overlay this on that, you get either one through here or one through here. That's not what happened. What had happened was these photons actually arranged themselves or they, uh, they appeared on the sensor, on the detector, to be arranged in a wave pattern. What does that mean? I'll show you. Like that. Now you probably definitely can't see that. So that's what that looks like. That is what happened when we fired photons through the double slit. It appeared as if hundreds of different photons became distributed in a wave pattern. Now, this is really weird. This is where quantum physics comes from because like I said, you would expect it to either just get some here, right? Or some here. So what is happening between, sorry, what is happening between here and here that causes this interruption in events to occur? that causes this illogical formation of energy. Now, what they wanted to do to figure this out, this is where the observer idea comes into play. They took the sensor from here and they put it in here. So like, what the F is going on inside these double slits? And they put the sensor in here to see what was happening at the double slit. And what they found when they were watching the information and they were recording the data, what they call the which way data, that's when you begin to get a logical sort of phenomena that falls in line with Newtonian mechanics. You get a bunch of dots on one side of the slit or the other. So you see what's happening? This is when the detector is here. Now this is also known as the observer. Okay. Terrible writing, doesn't matter. The observer, this is what has become synonymous with the observer. Now when you move the observer over here, this is what you get. When the detector is here, this is the information you get. But when there's no detector here, and you have the double slits, you get the wave shape. Now, let us recall where all this began, Newtonian mechanics, as in Isaac Newton set out to do away with the notion that there are non-tangible forces at play in the universe. The first law of Newtonian mechanics, an object which is in motion, will stay in motion unless acted upon by another outside force, another outside object external to it. And this, sorry, this, without the detector, when you don't have the information of the which way data, you get the waveform. Where was I going with this? Oh, right. And <laughs> so without 
the act of observing, which isn't actually an outside force within the Newtonian model. Just because you know something about something, okay, because we call it the observer effect, and people must think that you're actually looking at something with your eyes. It's not actually looking. It's the idea that you have information available to the experimenter about the nature of the experiment. So nobody ever looked at a photon, okay? This is a great, a great confusion that, these, that most people have fallen is that there is no photons. There is not even electrons in school, in physics. I don't know about physics, actually, in chemistry. They teach you about the particles and atoms, and they say, look, here is one way to look at it, the particle definition and the particle mechanics and the particle physics, and here's another way to look at it, as a wave, with wave mechanics, with a wave definition and how matter acts like a wave. So matter, we don't know what matter is. We don't have a correct model. We think, well, you know, it's kind of like a particle. It's kind of like a wave. This is where we get the notion of wave-particle duality at because matter has a non-physical component, which is matter's wave mechanic is a non-physical physics, okay? It's not physical. It's not, uh, you can't touch it. You can't measure it. So what does this mean? Particles are not real. There is no such thing as a particle. In the wise words of John Archibald Wheeler, the world-renowned physicist, the guy who invented terms like black holes, wormholes, white holes, he said, it from bit that the universe is basically a digital simulation and that information, information, knowledge itself is the fundamental nature of reality. That's what he said back in 1970 something. He devised a number of experiments that were similar to the original double slit experiments, which just played around with the idea of where you can put the detector, where the observer really is. Is the observer here? Is it here? Is it here? Is it both of these places, he did some ones where you run it around and the observer's not actually looking at the slits, he's looking at a function of the slits. And so there's a lot of different ways you can look at this, but essentially it, double slit mechanics, breaks the very first law of Newtonian mechanics that objects that are in motion cannot be altered, their motion, their course cannot be altered without an external force. And up until the 1940s, we did not believe that knowledge was an external force. We believed it was a delusion of brain chemistry, and most scientists still work under that presumption, which hurts my soul, because anybody that knows, like Einstein, who was a fucking Freemason, knows actually that uh, the fundamental nature of life is distinctly non-physical and separate from the human body and from the physical world. So I call that the very first understanding, like the very first, the precipice of the spiritual worldview. Because you go back into the Hermetic text, you go back into the Masonic lore, you go back into Crowley's works, you go back into maybe not somebody that's so freaking evil, maybe uh, like Falun de Fa or Jeremy, uh, sorry, not Jeremy, a guy who wrote that book, Biocentrism. You go and you look into some new models of reality to see what actually is the nature of life. And you come across these guys who have put forth some incredible things which are bridging the traditional ancient wisdom, which states very clearly that human being is God in God's image and reincorporating that back into the scientific worldview. I think that's fucking really, really awesome because frankly, there's a better model. There's a better, mo a better model of the nature of the world. And when people realize what this really means, that knowledge alone can alter the structure of reality and the mechanics of reality, then the whole, the whole entire inquiry of science and scientists is going to change from looking at these particles, which are enigmatic to say the least, like, you can't actually pinpoint one. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The more you know about its location, the less you know about its velocity. You can't have one and the other. You can only have one. I think, ooh, there's a word for that. It's like, uh, it escapes me now. But, so the scientists are going to have to start looking at the observer. 
basically is what this means. This is what alchemy is. Alchemy comes from Kemet, meaning the black fertile sands, means blackness, the study of blackness. And so I've always said alchemy is the study of your closed eyelids because it's within you. You are the observer. You have to study yourself to know yourself, to expand and actualize what you truly are. And so I doubt, I don't know if that makes any, any sense to you or has any weight to you. I probably could have done this a lot better and I will, I'll do it again eventually. And, um, Hopefully it'll be more clear that time. But in the meantime, I needed to tell you. I needed to tell you because this is the, the idea of materialism. It's um, foolish. Some absolute tomfoolery. And we need to correct our cultural karma. I don't want to, like, I don't want society to implode, okay? Say a nation divided against itself will fall. You know, science divided against the truth will lead you into madness and will lead society exactly to where society is, is at today in a prison of, um, in a prison of flesh. And really, like, we need to transcend the fleshy form. Really? 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 Okay, so thank you for listening to me try to explain what I felt like needs to be explained. Although there's still a lot left unsaid, you know, stick around if you want to hear more about it. Have a grand existence. Thank you very much. Love.